are still making the choice to open their hearts and homes to children in need. Congress has worked in the past to reduce barriers that would be, that would be adoptive parents face. I will continue my efforts to make sure adoption remains an option for children in foster care who can't be reunited with their family, women facing an unexpected pregnancy, and all parents willing and able to provide a safe and loving home for kids in need. There were over 100,000 children in the foster care system waiting for adoption in 2019. That 100,000 is approximately one-fourth of the number of kids that are in foster care. Congress must work in a bipartisan way, as it has for many years, to make sure adoption can become a reality, not just a dream, for all of these kids. We must also make sure that child welfare agencies have the tools and flexibilities that need to serve, that they need to serve the families in their communities. For years in the Senate, I have worked to elevate the voices of youth in the foster care system. These young people are their best, own best advocates, and they can tell you that the thing they want most is a caring and lovely family and a permanent home. What would you expect from any of these young people that are moved from home to home, maybe two or three times in a given year? As I continue to work in Congress towards the goal of adopting, of helping all children find their forever family, I will always keep in the, the best interest of children at the forefront. I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Mr. President. Senator from Vermont is recognized. I thank you, Mr. President. I ask for the quorum call to be dispensed with. Without objection. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Morning business is closed. Under the previous order, the Senate will proceed to executive session to resume consideration of the following nomination, which the clerk will report. Nomination, the Judiciary, James Ray Knepp II of Ohio to be United States District Judge for the Northern District of Ohio. President. Senators recognized. Mr. President, I see the majority leader on the floor, and, the, and while I have, um, I have the floor, of course, as a matter of courtesy, I will yield to him if he has uh, some comments he wants to make and ask that I then uh, be recognized for mine. Without objection. I understand, uh, before I, I do yield, I understand Senator Schumer is coming. So I will, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll just yield the floor to accommodate our uh, two leaders, but then I would ask that I be recognized. Without objection. <clears throat> Majority leaders recognized. Mr. President, last week, uh, record numbers of Americans exercised the right, which generations risk everything, to hand on to us. I want to spend a few minutes this morning talking about what we saw last week, where we are now, and where our great country will go from here. There's one aspect of last week that has gotten lost that I want to single out right at the start. By every indication, the 2020 election appears to have been free from meaningful foreign interference there is no suggestion that our foreign adversaries were allowed to undermine the integrity of our process. According to the director of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Administration, quote, we have no, no evidence any foreign adversary was capable of preventing Americans from voting or changing vote tallies, end quote. General Paul Nakasone, the head of the NSA and U.S. Cyber Command, reported Tuesday night, quote, the actions we've taken against adversaries have ensured they're not going to interfere in our elections, end quote. The Trump administration and the Senate spent four years supporting the state and local election authorities on the front lines. New tools and information sharing partnerships, unprecedented coordination, hundreds of millions in new funding, new painful consequences for bad actors like Russia if they interfere. The absence of any reports of foreign interference is a ringing endorsement, a ringing endorsement of our bipartisan work. And it slams the door on the embarrassing, irresponsible rhetoric that some Washington Democrats spent four years broadcasting. Too many voices tried to talk down our progress, urged Americans actually not to have confidence, and smeared anyone as unpatriotic who opposed far-left proposals to rewrite election laws. Well, Mr. President, the people who pushed this hysteria could not have more egg on their face than they do right now. None of their demands became law, none of them. The Speaker of the House did not get to personally rewrite election law. And yet, because of the sensible bipartisan steps that some of us championed, our defenses and countermeasures proved to be radically, in radically better shape than back in 2016. So it's time, let's talk about where we are now. According to preliminary results, voters across the nation elected and re-elected Republican senators to a degree that actually stunned prognosticators. Likewise, the American people seem to have reacted to House Democrats' radicalism and obstruction by shrinking the Speaker's majority and electing more Republicans. And then there's the presidential race. 
Obviously, no states have yet certified their election results. We have at least one or two states that are already on track for a recount. And I believe the president may have legal challenges underway in at least five states. The core principle here is not complicated. In the United States of America, all legal ballots must be counted. Any illegal ballots must not be counted. The process should be transparent or observable by all sides, and the courts are here to work through concerns. Our institutions are actually built for this. We have the system in place to consider concerns, and President Trump is 100% within his rights to look into allegations of irregularities and weigh his legal options. Let's go back 20 years ago. 20 years ago, when Florida came down to a very thin margin, we saw Vice President Gore exhaust the legal system and wait to concede until December. More recently, weeks after the media had called President Bush's reelection in 2004, Democrats baselessly disputed Ohio's elections, electors and delayed the process here in Congress. In 2016, election law saw recounts or legal challenges in several states. If any major irregularities occurred this time of a magnitude that would affect the outcome, then every single American should want them to be brought to light. And if Democrats feel confident they have not occurred, they should have no reason to fear any extra scrutiny. We have the tools and institutions we need to address any concerns. The president has every right to look into allegations and to request recounts under the law. And notably, the Constitution gives no role in this process to wealthy media corporations. The projections and commentary of the press do not get veto power over the legal rights of any citizen, including the President of the United States. Now, more broadly, Mr. President, let's not have any lectures, no lectures about how the President should immediately cheerfully accept preliminary election results from the same characters who just spent four years refusing to accept the validity of the last election and who insinuated that this one would be illegitimate too if they lost again, only if they lost. So let's have no lectures on this subject from that contingent. In late August, Secretary Hillary Clinton said, quote, Joe Biden should not concede under any circumstances. I think this is going to drag out and he will win it if we don't give an inch. That same month, Speaker Pelosi and the Democratic leader both stated, quote, President Trump needs to cheat to win. In October, when Speaker Pelosi was shopping some conspiracy theory about the Postal Service, she recklessly said, quote, listen to this, I have no doubt that the president will lie, cheat, and steal to win the election. Now, does this sound like a chorus that has any credibility whatsoever to say a few legal challenges from President Trump represents some kind of crisis? At this time last week, small business owners in cities across America were boarding up their windows in case President Trump appeared to win and far left mobs decided to reprise their summer rioting. Suffice it to say, a few legal inquiries from the president do not exactly spell the end of the Republic. Here's two professors from Fordham Law School and New York Law School. This is how they put it. Quote, for centuries, we've asked people who are unhappy with their fellow citizens or government agencies and institutions, bring their claims to court. President Trump is, quote, a traditional response that affirms rather than undermines American institutions, end quote. This process will reach its resolution. Our system will resolve any recounts or litigation. 
In January, the winner of this election will place his hand on a Bible, just like it happened every four years since 1793. What we know for sure is that the outcome is guaranteed to delight tens of millions of Americans and disappoint tens of millions of Americans. But we also know that we will wake up on January 21st, still blessed to live in the greatest nation the world has ever seen. And in no small part, that is because we respect the rule of law, we trust our institutions, and neither of those things is outweighed by pronouncements from partisans or the press. <clears throat> and now on an entirely different matter, Mr. President. <coughs> The last several days have brought huge good news in our fight to beat the terrible virus. This morning, one drug manufacturer announced that ongoing trials suggest their candidate for a COVID-19 vaccine may be more than 90% effective. 90% <coughs> effective. This is a huge testament to the ingenuity of the American private sector and their global partners and to the historic efforts of Congress and the Trump administration. We flattened regulatory roadback, roadblocks, we sped up trials, and laid groundwork to buy and distribute a vaccine as fast as possible. Last week, we learned the unemployment rate has fallen to 6.9%. 6.9%. With more than 630,000 new jobs added just in the month of October. Now remember, back in the springtime, many experts estimated we would still be saddled with double-digit joblessness through the end of this year. Turns out, the news is a whole lot better. Another testament to the strong economic foundations that Congress and the Trump administration spent three years laying before the pandemic struck. And most of all, to the resilience the incredible resilience of the American people. So to be clear, our work is not finished. Too many Americans are still suffering economically and infections are climbing across the country. We cannot give up on common sense measures like wearing masks just because we've grown tired of them. The Senate's going to have a busy few weeks. I hope our Democratic colleagues will finally put aside their all or nothing obstruction and let the targeted pandemic relief, targeted pandemic relief is what we need, let it move forward. In any event, we will need to fund the government, reach agreement with the House on the National Defense Authorization Act and confirm more thoroughly qualified nominees. So I welcome all my colleagues back to the chamber and I look forward to finishing this year strong. Our states and our country are counting on us. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
that. The minority leader recognizes. We are in quorum. I ask unanimous consent the quorum be dispensed with. Without objection. Now, Mr. President, last Tuesday, our country conducted the most sacred process in our democratic system of government, a national election. It was an election unlike any other in modern history. Much of the voting was done before Election Day itself. As a global pandemic forced states to adjust their balloting and voting procedures, the counting of the vote took a little longer than most Americans might have expected or hoped. Indeed, some of the final tabulations are not yet complete. It is still to be determined which party will hold a majority in this chamber. But we do know a few things. First, and most importantly, former Vice President Joseph Robinette Biden will become the 46th President of the United States. Our dear colleague, the distinguished Senator from California, Kamala Harris, will be the next Vice President of the United States. And on January 20th, the country will finally, finally turn the page on one of the most divisive and chaotic chapters in our history. President-elect Joe Biden has told the country that it's time to come together and heal, to unify once again, to fight not our political opponents, but our common enemies, disease and poverty and injustice. There's no person better suited to the task than the former vice president. He will be a great president for all Americans. Vice President-elect Harris, meanwhile, has just made history four times over. She will be the first African-American woman, the first Asian-American woman, the first biracial woman, and the first woman, period, to ever serve as vice president of these United States. I congratulate the former vice president, his wife, Jill, our colleague, Senator Harris, and her husband, Doug, on their hard-fought hard victory. More Americans voted for President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris than any ticket in our nation's history. They have given them an enormous burden, a decisive mandate, to take the reins of the executive branch and marshal this government into action. For they will assume the high offices of the presidency and the vice presidency at a time of unprecedented challenge. Our great nation faces the greatest economic crisis in 75 years, the greatest public health crisis in a century. Extraordinary inequalities of wealth and income strike at the heart of the idea of America as a land of equal opportunity. Racial disparities in our society strike at the heart of the idea of America as a place of equal justice. Climate change threatens the very future of our planet. The American people have placed their faith in President-elect Biden to confront those challenges head on, to relieve their suffering, to repair our democracy, to recover our economy, and rebuild a country and a planet for this generation and for the next. I have no doubt their faith will be rewarded, but I also have no doubt that the task ahead is daunting. While the country prepares for a change in administration, it must also brace for the darkest days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the weekend, the United States recorded its 10 millionth case. We are now confirming nearly 100,000 new cases of COVID per day, on track to eclipse more than a million new cases per week. As exhausted and impatient as we all are for our lives, our livelihoods to return to normal, experts are warning us that the worst phase is still ahead. The quickest way to turn the tide, crush the virus, and get back to normal is to do what we should have been doing all along. Take the virus seriously, listen to the scientists, and dedicate the necessary resources to get the job done. President-elect Biden is already preparing to do just that. Today, he named several health experts and scientific advisors to serve on a COVID-19 task force. It sends the right signal that while the president-elect will not assume office for another few months, his administration will hit the ground running, and his policy on COVID-19 will refreshingly be de de dictated by facts and by science. It's a major turning point that soon 
we will have an administration that actually acknowledges that this is a health care crisis, that knows our economy won't fully recover until we solve it. I'm confident that a Biden administration will do that, but Congress must play its part too. Nearly 15 million Americans have lost health insurance through their employer. Democrats have a solution to that problem. Let's get it done and make sure those families have health coverage. Medicaid programs across the country are experiencing a huge influx of new enrollees, while state budgets struggle to bear the added costs. The HEROES Act ensures that Medicaid is strengthened and secured for the duration of this pandemic. Let's get that done, too. And today, we receive news that the entire world has been waiting for. A U.S. company has developed a vaccine for COVID-19 that, according to the preliminary research in the news reports, is 90 percent effective. The FDA said it would approve a vaccine that was 50 percent effective. So while the FDA needs to review the vaccine, to have a vaccine as, that is 90 percent effective is about as good as it gets. We Democrats will do everything we can to make sure this vaccine, or any vaccine, is distributed quickly, fairly, equitably. And the challenge is now one of scale and one of delivery. Congress should fund a national vaccination program. And the administration, whether it's the Trump administration or the Biden administration, must do everything to reach minority and underserved communities, combat vaccine hesitancy, and ensure that the vaccines are free to everyone. This will be a massive and complex undertaking, unlike anything that our country has seen. <coughs> and we must all work together, from the President to Congress, down to local community health departments, to ensure that it gets done right, and it gets done fairly, and it gets done equitably. So while the incoming administration prepares to take on the surge of COVID-19, Congress should pass a strong, comprehensive COVID relief bill that actually meets the needs of the American people. Excuse me. It comes to health care, education, testing, tracing, unemployment benefits, and many other critical issues, <clears throat> this Republican majority has proposed totally inadequate solutions. As the disease surges across our country once again, there is no time for inadequate solutions. I hope, now that the election is behind us, our colleagues come, are ready to come together in a search for an adequate bipartisan solution rather than the partisan stunt voting legislating we've suffered for the past few months. Now, I must spend a moment on something that will garner too much attention over the next few weeks. Baseless claims by the President and his supporters that there has been widespread voter fraud and that the election was somehow rigged or stolen from President Trump. <coughs> That kind of rhetoric is extremely dangerous, extremely poisonous to our democracy. As in any campaign, the president has a right to bring legal challenges or request recounts where state law allows. However, there is no legal right to file frivolous claims. Lawsuits must have basis in facts, in evidence. And make no mistake, there has been no evidence of any significant wide or widespread voter fraud. Joe Biden won this election fair and square. The margins of his victory are growing by the day. And former, Vice, former President George W. Bush commendably acknowledged that fact when he congratulated President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris on their victory. Now, Republican leaders in Congress should also do the right thing. Republican leaders must unequivocally condemn the president's rhetoric 
and work to ensure the peaceful transfer of power on January 20th. I have been heartened to see a few of my Republican colleagues, it's three I believe, congratulate the winning ticket. But too many, including the Republican leader, have been silent or sympathetic to the President's fantasies. Even some nonpartisan members of the current administration <coughs> have refused to move forward with the formal process for an incoming administration. According to the Washington Post, the administrator of the General Services Administration has declined to sign a letter for allowing President-elect Joe Biden's transition team to formally begin its work. It does not matter whether the President is happy about the results of the election. The peaceful transfer of power is a hallmark, the bedrock of our democracy, and it must proceed unimpeded. The GSA administrator should sign the paperwork immediately in order to allow the important work of the presidential transition to proceed. America remains in the middle of a worsening health and economic crisis, and there's no excuse, none, for the outgoing administration to impede the new administration's preparations to deal with these urgent challenges. There is no law or requirement that President Trump concede the election or leave the office of the presidency with grace. But as history prepares to write the final few sentences on the Trump presidency, it will surely note how this president and his Republican allies here in Congress treated our, treated our democracy on his way out the door. I yield the floor. Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I, I believe under our original agreement I'm recognized next. Is that yes, right? sir. And um, I appreciate what the Democratic leader has said. I, um, and I was willing to step step aside earlier when I had the floor because I understood the two leaders were coming to speak and as a matter of courtesy to them and I know the Democratic leader at least appreciated that so uh, let me um, agree with what he said you know, I, I came here and the President of the United States who was an unelected president an unelected vice president as Jerry Ford, and then under our uh, change in our law since uh, President Kennedy's death, was able to pick a um, unelected vice president. I remember Democrats and Republicans alike uh, welcoming him and saying, "Let's go forward." And I've been here with each president. Uh, some re-elected, some not, and in every instance, I see the outgoing president welcoming the incoming president, Republican or Democratic, and they've done it to try to make a smooth a transition, not for their own political purposes, but for the good of the United States of America. Everyone has done that. George, I think of George H.W. Bush welcoming Bill Clinton, who had defeated him. I remember Al Gore, who had more votes than George uh, W. Bush, but after the court had ruled, graciously conceded to George W. Bush. I remember Hillary Clinton with well over two million more votes than Donald Trump, but saying, here's what the Electoral College is, and, and conceding. Now we see Joseph Biden, with more votes than anybody has ever gotten in the history of the United States for president, and the incumbent president, as he goes off golfing again and again, pretends that he doesn't have to step back. And in fact, actually does everything possible to make it difficult for the new president to handle the transition. That's wrong. Just as I've encouraged both Democrats and Republicans as president, you help the incoming president with transition. 
not for your political reasons or their political reasons, but for the good of all of us as Americans. And to say, oh no, we're gonna, we're gonna hold the key to the door of the transition office. Every Republican, every Democrat voted for the money for that transition office. So that whoever is president could step forward and not hurt the country by coming in without doing the necessary preparation. And they're like a little child in a playground. No, we got the key, we got the key. We're not gonna let you have the key. Oh, come on. Do you know how this makes us look to the rest of the world? Do you know how it makes us look at my state of Vermont, where some Republicans voted for Donald Trump, some voted for Joe Biden. The majority voted in this case for Joe Biden. But I've been hearing from Vermonters all over both parties. What's going on? It's over. It's gone for the country. In that regard, let me just speak briefly about the president-elect and the vice president-elect. When I came to this body, I was the most junior member of the United States Senate and the second youngest. The youngest was a senator from Delaware who had been elected just two years before, Joe Biden. And I think the fact that we were the two youngest, we bonded over that. And I got to know his family. I knew the tragedy he had when his first wife was killed, his daughter was killed, but he'd go home every day to make sure that he could put his sons to bed, be there with them. I don't know how many times, Mr. President, we'd be staying down there in the well. He's looking at his watch, he said, what time do you think the last boat's gonna be? Because the next train to Delaware is at such such time. And he's like a marathon runner going out the door to make sure he got the train, which he did, to be home to take care of his children. And I remember how happy Marcel and I were when he met Jill. What a wonderful woman. Dr. Biden was everything you'd want in a first lady in this, in this country. We had the privilege of traveling with both of them, seeing the, the love and the joy they had in each other's company, the love and the joy they've shown in their children and grandchildren and continue to. I watched Joe Biden with a sense of dignity as he ran, as he ran for election to the presidency, an office he had hoped to hold, but probably thought he never would. <clears throat> I know that he had wanted to run four years ago, but it's too close to the time of losing his son, Bo and I'd had the privilege of knowing Bo. In fact, the last time I talked to him was on the, on the battlefields in Iraq where he had, was serving in combat for the, our U.S. military. And I told him at that 